We have an hour together and we want to make the most of this time for you and for everybody here. Um, so first of all, thank you for coming and being here, being present. Um, I'm going to do a quick intro and then we're going to pass it over to Miguel, who's going to be our host for today. Um, we're going to have 15 minutes of Q&A at the end and then we'll just do some closing and a group photo because, you know, we got to take a picture together. Um, that's what we do. And um, yeah, this will be a one hour event and we're, we're hoping that you're enjoying your lunch or a little snack or your meal with us. And we're hoping to get you out on time today. So let's jump into it. So, you know, this, this event will be recorded for anybody who's unable to be here today and it will be posted on our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, and then, so Te Quería, our mission is to support the Latinx community, Latinx professionals in tech, provide as many resources through events, partnerships, access to different jobs. You can join our Slack channel to get a lot of this information. And also, you know, we have a lot of other resources for allies as well. So anyone is welcome to join. Um, the full Slack channel access will be only given to Latinx professionals in tech. So you can join the fun. We do ask you to just unmute yourself for now. You can leave your video on. Um, and then any questions that you have, drop them in the chat. Once we have the Q&A portion, you can raise your hand and ask us questions. But Val's actually also gonna walk us through that. And you know, throughout the session, just engage in the chat. Let us know what you're thinking, if you're resonating with something, if you're really <laughs> loving what they're saying, let us know in the chat. Uh, we do have a code of conduct. We want to make sure that this is an inclusive space for everybody, that everyone feels welcomed. We ask you to, you know, be your best self, uplift each other, and refrain from using any other offensive language, um, spamming each other, or using this as a platform to target anyone. We also want to make sure that we all stay connected. So don't drop your LinkedIn information in the chat because that's going to get really busy. We actually have a whole nother file for you to drop in your information. It's a Google Doc that you can share afterwards. Look for people there um, and connect with new people. If this is not your first time at one of our Thickety events, you're probably already connected with a lot of people. So I invite you and challenge you to just connect with other people who you have already connected with. And I mean like connect, like let's set up 15 minutes to chat. Let's you know make this happen and let's chat about how we're doing and how we can help and uplift each other. Um, special shout out to all of our event leads. So we have everyone from marketing partnerships and events. And also today we have two special volunteers. So ECs and Val, thank you for joining us. And I'm gonna hand it over to our speaker for the day. So Miguel is a C CFP, which is a certified financial planner. And, you know, we talked about doing something for the community, something about using his passion for financial planning and, you know, personal planning, um, and how can we bring it to our Thicket community. We did a quick little survey within different people in different groups, and this is one of the most upvoted topics. So we are here today by your own choice, and I'm going to pass it over to Miguel now. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, this is a community that I really enjoy, appreciate, love being a part of. And today we're going to be talking about money. But really, the talk is more than just money. Really, when we talk about money, we're really talking about feelings and the emotion that money brings to us whether if it's joy, if it's sadness, if it's anxiousness, if it's happiness, if it's whatever it may be. I was just reading the, the comments in the chat and definitely all you could see there and invite you to take a look at it, you can see the feelings that you're all feeling. And thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing what makes you nervous about your financial situation or your financial journey. So today, our focus of the session is intergenerational wealth. So really, and I saw a lot of the comments there and, and thank you for putting them again. You, you were talking about supporting your parents, supporting your children, supporting yourself, uh, building a house, uh, creating wealth, 
making sure that you're doing the right things with your money. So that's a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. But really, so who am I? Who am I to talk about this? Well, as I'll say, my name is Miguel Gomez. I'm a fiduciary. I'm a fee-only financial advisor, but I'm also an educator, a financial educator. And I really love doing this. I really love getting in front of groups, talking with them about money, showing them a, lot of, a little bit of what I learned about over the years of working really with millionaires. That's the type of people that I work with, how they build their wealth, what they did, what they've done, how we help them build that wealth. And also, if you're not a millionaire yet, well, what can you learn from those people so that you yourself become one? So that's a lot, little bit of what we're going to be talking today. So this is me. First picture on the left, you may recognize him if you're Mexican, Cepillin. Uh, he died a couple, a couple of weeks ago. My dad actually worked at his circus. Uh, he worked there. He worked there for a number of years. I could not not get a picture with him. Then you see my mom in the middle uh, with the elephants. She used to ride elephants at a circus when, when circuses had elephants. That's what my mom, what my mom did. She was a performer at the circus. And then the final picture you see me and my dad. Actually, that's the time that we came to the border in Ciudad Juarez. I live in El Paso now. I've, I've been here since 2007. We came to the border at that time because the circus came to Ciudad Juarez. And they thought it was kind of cool to come and take a picture of the bridge. We didn't cross to the US because none of us got documents. So we just came to the bridge, took a picture and came back to Juarez. A funny thing, uh, that's the same bridge that I used to cross when I, when I come over every time when I go to Juarez and visit family in Mexico. Anyway, so that's me. I work at a firm in El Paso, Texas called Lorback Financial Advisors. We manage about 450 million for about 320 clients, 320 families and businesses and retirement plans and so on. Uh, I'm a proud member of these two organizations. Uh, NAFA, the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors, and XY Planning Network. And really, when you're thinking about hiring a financial advisor for the first time, I encourage you to go to these two places. These are uh, people that are committed to be fiduciaries. That means working, putting your interests ahead of their own. That's what we do. That's what we sign up for. We don't sell products, we don't sell insurance, we don't sell any investments, we only sell our advice. So go to their websites, napfa.org, xyplanningnetwork.com, you, you can find an advisor there. And interview a number of them. Don't go with the first one you talk with, talk with a couple, see which one you like, and start working with them. And one big myth about hiring a financial advisor you don't have to be a millionaire to hire a financial advisor, particularly if you hire one which is a member of, of XY Planning Network. It, there's a lot of members that, I've seen members uh, of XY Planning Network that they start charging 25 bucks a month for a financial planner. So don't think that it's only for millionaires, go there if you need one. Well, I've been featured in a number of, 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 of media places, CBS News, Wharton Business Radio, Yahoo Finance, Kiplinger, Huffington Post, and with Cesar Lozano and a number of others. In my podcast, you're free to find it. It's called Dinero en Español. I launched it seven years ago and it usually gets between 13 and 15,000 monthly downloads. Anyway, enough about me. Let's talk about intergenerational wealth planning. It's going to see what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about what it is, how do you get it, how you structure your wealth for intergenerational planning, some questions to ask yourself your partner, your advisor, your financial planner, even your family. And we're gonna close with Q&A. So any questions you may have, we're gonna go through them at the end. So how do you define intergenerational wealth? Well, it's simple and it's very complicated at the same time. It's simple because it's wealth that it's intended to serve more than one generation. And what I mean by more than one generation, I mean beyond yourself. And you, as, as, you, as some people say in the chat, it could be your children, it could be your nephews, your nieces, whatever. It could be someone else in a generation different than yours. It could even be your brother or your sister, for example. That's okay. So, it, well, that is intended to serve more than one generation. 
So how do we get it? How do we get multi-generational wealth? Well, there are basically three ways. The first one is you win it, all right? You buy a lottery ticket, you, you win your 350 million, you pay taxes, you end up with 150, all wonderful. Well, also very unlikely. So let's just cross that out. That's not the topic of our discussion today. Second way, you get it through inheritance. Well, also very nice, very beautiful, but that's not what we're gonna talk about today. So the third thing is, the third way is you build it. That's really gonna be the focus of our session today, how you build intergenerational wealth. All right, so how do you do it? How do you structure your wealth for intergenerational planning? And this is where, where as people usually say, where the rubber meets the road, well, you start thinking about what kind of assets are there for yourself. Everything starts with yourself. So the biggest assets you have, your cash flow, the money coming in to you from different sources, maybe your salary, maybe your rent properties, maybe whatever there else, whatever else, money coming to you, cash flow. Cash flow is an asset. Second thing, your retirement accounts. Your employer probably offers a 401k. You may have an IRA. You may have old IRAs or, or all 401ks. And that's okay. If you're, you're already contributing to them, you will contribute, continue to contribute to them as, as much as you're able to do so. Once you feel your annual um, contribution to your retirement accounts, IRA, 401k, whatever, and if you're still able to, to save more, that's when you start opening an investment account, an after-tax investment account. And we can spend hours talking about the benefits of one or the other. That's not the point of today's session. Then you're also gonna start getting property. And you're also gonna, your, your company will, may give you stocks. You may be able to buy real estate. They may give you stock units and so, and so on. Those are assets that are essentially there for you at first, right? Then you start thinking, well, I have my assets. What about children? Notice that I didn't say your children. I just said children because it may not be your own children. It may be your niece. It may be your nephew. It may be some other children that you care about that you're thinking about giving money to. So how do you give money to that children or to those children? Well, you start with cash flow. Same thing, money that is coming in for you regularly, salary, whatever other sources you give money to them. Second, you may open a, a 529 account. A 529 account is an account that is used to save for education. You can open it for anybody. It doesn't have to be your children. And, and then the benefit of that account is that you put after tax money into it and it grows uh, tax free as long as the funds are used for education. And you say, well, what if I don't save? What if I don't want to save for the education? What if you just want to Say for them. Well, in that case, you open an account for their benefit. This OGMA, OGMA accounts, essentially what you're doing is you're opening an account for them under their name. When they turn to majority, 18 or 21, that account will switch over to them and it will be their money. Essentially, it's their money. You're taking care of it and you're gonna give it to them once they get to majority. Then if they, maybe they work for you, maybe they're able to work for you, then you can open a Roth IRA for them and you can contribute to that account for them, for their benefit. And then really the, you, if, you, if you're thinking of a ladder, different levels of complexity, the more complex or the highest step of the ladder is you set up a trust for them, okay? So, but I wouldn't suggest get a trust until you've done maybe the other more simpler steps. Right then, so then we go to the other type of people, assets for adult family members. Well, what do you do? Well, you can send them money from your cash flow. As you get your salary, you set us whatever amount, fixed amount, and you send them money. Well, of course, it's gonna depend. Are they in the US? Are they internationally? Are they in Mexico? Are they in our country? Are they in South America somewhere? Are they in their home place? That also determines, well, are you gonna open a separate bank account for them? Is that bank account gonna be based in the US, based in their home country, based on where they're gonna be in the future? You start funding that account for them, for their benefit. 
then at some point, well, saving is not enough. Maybe you open a separate investing account. Maybe that account is under your name, but it's labeled for them. It's their account. It's money that you're setting away for them once they get to a certain age, once they get to a certain health situation, you define that. You just have those assets ready for them for when they need them. Then you can also buy what it's called in the US a longevity annuity. Again, I don't sell annuities. I don't sell any type of insurance or investment product. Essentially a longevity annuity is it's an insurance product that what you do is just you put money away every month and that contract, what it does is once they, once that person turns 80, that contract is gonna start paying them money back. Essentially give them, give them money every month based on the savings that you put away for them. But they need, to be, they need to reach a certain age, usually 80 or 81, 82, depending on the, on the contract. This is a way for them to ensure at least a certain level of income for them. Again, depending on the complexity, you can also set a trust for their benefit, all right? So these are the different ways that you can give assets to those family members or to those people. Well, and then the biggest question, a very important question is what happens if you die before they do? What happens to them? And this is, a, this is something that you need to understand. Well, if they are relying on your income, if, if, you, are their, if you are essentially, uh, this is what some one client told me once, I know that I am my parents' pension. What happens if you're in that situation? What happens if you die before them and all of a sudden you're no longer there to be their pension? Well, that's why it's so important to have an estate plan. Having an estate plan, if you have someone that is gonna rely on you, is very important. But also communicating that estate plan is hugely critically important. A will that people don't know exists is like, there's no will it, and family fights are gonna happen. It, it's, it, it can get nasty very quickly. Uh, but then the other thing is life insurance. If you don't have life insurance, if you're starting out, if you're starting out in your career, if you are, if you, are, if you haven't built a, 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 a relatively big portfolio to help sustain the, those family members, this is where life insurance comes into play. The purpose of life insurance is to replace income. If you have people that is gonna rely on your income in the future, then that's why you, you buy life insurance. And that's when you, life, that's when you buy life insurance. Uh, so if you think you're gonna support your parents, uh, if you know you're gonna support your parents and you don't have the assets to support them, and you're just building those assets, totally fine. But if you die before you're able to build those assets, that's when life insurance comes into play. And for someone that is under 30, for someone that is even 35 or 40, it can be ridiculously cheap. I mean, I'm talking 18, 25 bucks for 500,000 of benefit, $500,000 of that benefit. So it can be very, very, very cheap. Well, really the, Biggest question that people ask me when we're talking about intergenerational wealth is how much do I need? How much money do I need to support my family? How much money do I need for my kids? How much money do I need for my niece? And I'm sorry to tell you, this is the answer that I hate, absolutely hate the most, but I need to give it. It depends. It depends. And there are so many factors that, that make this determination, how much money you make, how much money you're planning on giving them, how often, and so on. So this is where really thinking about what you really want to do, it, it, it helps a lot, thinking about what you really want to do. And this is where you start from dreaming what that, or thinking that you're gonna support your parents or your family member or whatever, to actually putting into numbers. So here are some questions for you to, to ask yourself. And then if you have a partner, a spouse, questions to discuss with that partner, with that spouse, with your financial planner, and at some point with your family member. So the first thing is how much money do I need to support myself? Do I need how much I spend? Do I know how much I spend every month? 
because a lot of people don't. A lot of people just spend as the money comes and they don't actually know how much they need. Well, you need to know how much you need to support yourself. Second question, who are we really talking about? What family members are we talking about? We're talking about supporting your partner, your spouse at some point in the future. Maybe that person does, maybe that person wants to stop working and, and, and you're gonna be a one income family. Well, who are we talking about? We talk about your children or talk about your parents, your partner's parents. It's not uncommon for people to support both sides of the, of the family when you're the first working, when you're the first professional working. It, your grandparents, your aunts, your uncles, your tios, even your padrinos. Really, this is when you start to think and really think through these things. It, don't leave it to, don't leave it to block, don't leave it to just let's see what happens. You really need to think this through. And then the next question is, what level of support do I want to provide these people? Do I want to support them in an unplanned manner? Meaning I'll just send them money here and there on their birthdays, on their anniversaries, on a special date, or just because I want to send them money. Totally fine, totally fine. Again, I'm, my job is not to judge. My job is not to criticize you or whatever. My job is to help you Make sure that you're making the right decisions with your money. If you want to send them money in an unplanned way, totally fine, nothing wrong with it. Then if you want to support them in a planned way for a while, this is when things start to get interesting because this is when you determine, okay, I'm, I want to provide them $1,000 a month until they'll start to receive their government pension. Or I give them $2,000 a month until they graduate from college. Once they're out of school, they're on their own. So this is the type of things that you need to think about. And then the hardest one, which is very important, which is I think where I'm gonna be with my own parents, I'm gonna support them until they die. Hard, they weren't, they didn't, they weren't able to save, they didn't save any money. Maybe their country, they value their currency and they lost everything they had. Maybe that happened multiple times, their savings are gone. Well, it happens and you need to plan for it. All right, so then the next thing is, well, how much will they rely on your income? Are you gonna be their only source of income? Are they gonna receive other sources? Uh, are they gonna continue to work on the, until they're able to? Uh, are they gonna uh, receive some government pension in the future? These are the kinds of things I need to talk, to talk with them because otherwise you're assuming you're assuming that you're gonna to need to send them money. You're assuming that you're, you're gonna to have to do whatever you need to do. Well, maybe they have a piece of land that, they, that you don't know they have and they'll sell it at some point. So just don't make these things obvious. Don't think it's evident, it is not. But it is very hard to speak about money with family. Um, now, this is also very important. Don't, I've seen cases where the family member feels entitled to your income. So I didn't work, I didn't save because I know that my kid is gonna support me. And that this is very common in Latin America. Well, do you even want to support them? Are you able to support them? Have these discussions with them. Then another question you need to ask yourself, well, as you start to build wealth, now I get it, if you are on a, on a paycheck to paycheck thing, you're just starting to build wealth. Maybe your wealth can only replace one week of income, maybe two weeks of income, maybe, maybe one month of income. But as time passes, as your income, as your income increases over time, you're gonna start asking and you're gonna to start to realize that your wealth is able to replace more of your income. At some point, there's gonna be, you're gonna get a point where your wealth is able to replace 20 years of income. 10 years of income, 15 years of income, and so on. And just don't be hard on yourself if you're not there yet. That's why you are starting. That's where we're planning. That's what we're working for. That's kind of your goal, to be able to, to build such a level of wealth that you can make work optional. So what do you do with all of this? You build a plan. You build a plan, you build a financial plan, 
can do it yourself. I'll, find, I'll share a couple of resources at the end. You can hire a financial planner to do so for you. But before talking about numbers, before reviewing any numbers, before any, mon any numbers discussion, spreadsheets, Monte Carlos or whatever other tools, the very first thing that you need to talk with yourself, with your partner, with your family, is your values. And I put the, the Mexican pyramid here because the, the foundation of that pyramid is what is keeping it there. Your values are the foundation of your plan. Once you understand your values, once you understand what is important for you, then you can start to, defer, to define, okay, I'm gonna stop spending on these, I'm gonna spend more of these, I'm gonna start saving for these because those are things that define what you're gonna do, your values. What's the most important resource for you? Your time. Most everybody in Tecaria, I'm talking young professionals, even if you're in your 40s, you're still young. If you're 50s, you're still young. Time is your most important resource. That time is what allows your investments to grow. Time is what allows your money to be there for you if you're able to set aside some of that income. So the more you're able to set aside, the more your wealth is going to grow. That comes to the second step. Your second most important resource is your cash flow, the money that you're bringing in every month, your salary, your second most important resource. And if you see your career, I'm almost sure that all, all the over 100 people that are listening right now on the live uh, video, I'm pretty sure that if you look back 10 years, you're making way more money than you were making 10 years ago. I'm pretty sure that's the case for all of us here. So just think what that cash flow is gonna be in the future as your career continue, continues to progress as your life continues to progress, you're more than likely gonna be, make more, be making more money than what you're making today. So it's what you do with that money, what's gonna allow you to build wealth. So when we talk about goals in financial planning, for me, your goals are just a reflection of your values. Your goals are a reflection of, your goals are your values made tangible. Meaning, okay, you don't want to get $2 million in your portfolio, in your investments. You want the life that those $2 million are going to be, provide to you. So think about the life that you want. Then based on that, that's what you use to build your portfolio. Then your goals, this is very important. That's why the cat jumping there is so critical here. Your goals can and should be flexible. My goals from five years ago were to make X amount of money every month. Well, there was a point where well, well, I've made that money and that money was certainly not enough to the way I wanted to live. So my goals changed and that's perfectly fine. Think about the goals that you had when you were a kid. The goals that you had when you just graduated from college, for example. The goals that you had when you first started working. You probably already accomplished some of them and that's totally fine. Your goals can and should be flexible. And then just close this, money is a tool. Never forget that money is just a tool. Your plan is your vision on how that tool is gonna work for you. So your financial plan, the, the things that you're gonna do with your money, with your time, with your energy, your resources, that is gonna create the vision of what you want for life and what you want from life, okay? So let me just close here, additional resources. The One Page Financial Plan is a fantastic, fantastic book that I recommend to everybody. It, it is simple, it is easy to understand, it is easy to execute. And the other two are really more about investing, investing made simple. But if you wanna start, if you wanna buy one of these three books, I would buy the one page financial plan. It's just terrific. And it will help you create a plan that works for you based on your own situation. Doesn't matter if you have debt, doesn't matter if you 
think that you start late, it's okay. Start where you are with what you have and use that to build a plan for your goals. All right, so I think we're good on time. I hope I didn't speak too, too fast. Um, <laughs> anyway, so let's open it up for questions. You can find me there. There's my LinkedIn link. There's my Facebook, my Facebook link. And if you want to find your my podcast, Dinero en Español, unfortunately, it's all in Spanish. But I think a lot of us here speak Spanish. If you don't speak Spanish, I'm sorry. <laughs> my podcast is all in Spanish. It's called Dinero en Español. And you can find it in your favorite post podcast platform. If, if anything else, let's pass it off to Tecaria and see what's next. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful um, workshop, Miguel. We do have some really, really great questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to start it off. Um, from Luz, she really wanted to know if you will be um, sending this PowerPoint anywhere because they would really love to review the information. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. That's really great. Okay. Um, the next question we have from Hector. So he says, I've had life insurance. I've heard life insurance is a decision to make only after starting family. What's your take on this? That's a very good point. And generally, that's, that's generally, I would agree with it. I mean, but the reason you buy life insurance is to replace your income in case you're no longer here. So if your parents, for example, if your spouse's parents, if someone is gonna rely on your income and you're no longer here, then that's the moment you buy life insurance. So someone other than your kids relying on your income, then there's a reason to buy life insurance. If you don't have anybody to rely on your income, then you probably don't need it. That's a really, really good way to put it. I'm gonna think about that too. Mm -hmm. uh, so moving on to the next question. Um, this one is also in a similar um, topic to life insurance from Ricardo. He says, um, how much life insurance should you purchase and what factors should you keep in mind? Sure. Okay, so just think uh, a, a napkin, a back of the napkin calculation is 10 years your income. So you take your income, you multiply it by 10. Uh, that's one way of looking at it. I would 99% of the time recommend term life insurance. Term life insurance essentially means that you're gonna buy a life insurance contract that is only cover you for a certain period of time, can be from 10 to 30 years. What that, when that time ends, you're no longer covered unless you pay an exponential amount of money. So think about the next 10 years, the next 20 years, the next 30 years. Uh, and, and determine how 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 far how far you're gonna go with that insurance. Also, a lot of companies offer life insurance to their employees. So check with your company benefits to see if they offer it. If that's the case, the problem with it is that many times it's not transferable from one company to the other. But it is very expensive. If you leave that company and you want to convert it to an individual policy, it can be very expensive. So. Just look for term term life insurance quotes, uh, and then compare. Thank you, um, thank you for that. That's really good. Mm -hmm. um, this is a question from uh, Karina. She says, "I have set up uh, beneficiaries on all my accounts. Is a will also recommended if there are no other assets?" Uh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat it? Yes. So Karina has set up all the beneficiaries mm -hmm. on all of her accounts. So would you also recommend adding a will if there are no other assets? That is a wonderful question. Um, that's something that, uh, that an attorney would be more qualified than me to answer. But uh, a couple of things about beneficiaries is making sure that you have them updated. I've seen some horror stories where a person divorces and then they don't update the beneficiary and then they die and then the ex gets the money. So be sure to keep your beneficiaries up to date. Any life change, change your beneficiaries. And um, you may not have any other assets today, but if you get them in the future, maybe I will, will cover them. Otherwise assets that I, otherwise they'll be untested. If, then you have other assets. You have your car, for example. If you have a car, maybe you have a computer, maybe you have personal items. 
that you don't care about, well, maybe they just sell them. Well, who gets the money if those assets get sold, for example? So you may have your accounts, but you may already have other assets that you haven't realized you have. So that's why you, you will have a will to cover those assets. That's really good. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, here are some other questions from some other guests. Um, they ask, what are some examples of separate investing accounts that can be listed under one's name that are available for building assets for adult family members? Sure. So what you do is you open a brokerage account, a standard brokerage account with your brokerage of choice. It could be Schwab, it could be Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, it could be Vanguard. And you can open the account under your own name. You can open the account under their name, whatever is, is easier for you, whatever you prefer. What I've seen people complaining about is they open up an account on someone else's name and then that person took the money and just was never responsible about it. So if you want to keep control of it, maybe leave it under your name. And when you're ready to give it, then just give it to them. But again, it's just personal preference, whatever you feel better. Lots of good brokerage accounts. Okay, uh, moving on to some of our other questions. This one's a really good one, and I'm sure a lot of people in the audience are kind of curious about this. Um, any advice for building assets for undocumented adult family members? That's a very good question. Uh, here is, I would suggest starting with setting the assets under your own name and building that wealth under your own name. And then if their situation changes at that time, maybe consider giving them, giving them the assets. Um, there's some tax issues with undocumented persons. There a lot of entities don't wanna work with undocumented persons. So maybe the easiest way for you is just opening them under your own name. And then if something changes, then you can just give them the, the keys to the, to the account or the, the keys to the account, change it to their name or give it to them. That's really good. Thank you for that. Um, another question from the audience, they ask, how often should we readjust our financial goals? That's a terrific question. I would think when there's big, uh, well, one, the, the, the most obvious answer to me is when you, when you reach your goals. You wanted to make X, now you're making X. Okay, what's next? The next answer would be, well, when something big changes in your life. So you're for example, if you've got children, maybe that kid started middle school, or maybe you're making more money than before, or maybe when there are big changes in your life and big, again, relative to your own situation. I, I, I don't like imposing things every five years, every six years. No, because it's really depending on your own situation. When you think that you that, that goal does not satisfy you anymore, for example, maybe it's time to look differently or to look for something else. Perfect. This kind of speaks to um, the values thing that you're talking mm -hmm. about in your presentation. I love that. Um, this exactly. is another question from Ricardo, which I also kind of really resonate um, with. He asks, how can I find a financial planner that is BIPOC, that is um, Black, Indigenous, person of color? Looking mm -hmm. at the NAPFA, uh, NAPFA page, there isn't a lot of diversity in the field of my area. That's a terrific question, Ricardo. Thank you. So Couple of things, uh, when you look at the CFP board, I'm a CF certified financial planner. They made a survey a couple of years ago and only 3% of all the CFP members identify as black or Hispanic. So we have a huge, huge underrepresentation problem in the industry. It is changing for sure, it, it, but it's, it's taking time for that change to occur. So NAFA is a more traditional organization. They've been around for 20 something years uh, and they have, they have recognized they have that issue. You may wanna consider also looking at XY Planning Network. And then another thing, if you're open to working virtually with people from other places, it, maybe that will, that will allow you to find other, other people of those, of those characteristics. So I know, I know XY Planning Network, for example, they're geared a lot towards virtual planning. So you're maybe, you may be in California and your advisor is in Texas or in New York or Nevada or whatever. So 
if you're open to working virtually, maybe that will that will help you widen your your choices of advisors. Wonderful, thank you. We're getting such really good questions. I hope Great. we get to them all. Um, here's another question um, from Claudette. She said, I really loved when you said the more you're able to set aside, the more your um, wealth will grow. She has a situation, her spouse and her have the possibility of minimizing their expenses um, in terms of cost of living and only one income to live off of and the other to save. Is this financial plan common and how can this help set up um, Oh, how, how can they help set this up? Sure. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I have uh, some of my favorite clients are precisely this type of people that uh, they, uh, both of them are working. One of them, they pay everything with the income of one and the other income goes 100% into savings. So yes, it is doable. It is possible. It's just starting with understanding how much, starting to reduce it little by little. Uh, start saving, thinking as, what if you thought, okay, I lost my job. You obviously haven't, but one of you think that and make it live, like if you live as if you just lost your job in that you're not think that you don't have that income anymore and you just put it all to savings or investments or whatever. So yes, it is doable, it is possible. I know people doing it. I work with people doing it. So yes, absolutely. And it's wonderful that you're thinking that way. I really like that too. Okay, uh, moving on to the next question. Is it okay to have multiple retirement savings account? Um, this person says, when I left my former employer, I usually don't move my money from the 403B account to my new retirement account. It is possible, uh, but here's the thing. As your career progresses and you change, as you change more and more employers, what's gonna end up happening and what I've seen people happening with is they forget that they have that money somewhere else. I've seen people literally forgetting that they have $100,000 in X way, X place. So it could be a problem. Now, it could be better if you roll, just continue to roll over everything into a single employer because it's easier to manage everything under one place. It would be a pain to do the transfers and everything, but it's a one time thing. The other thing would be, well, maybe your new employer has limited investment options or limits in how you can invest your money. Maybe you consider rolling everything into an IRA and that way you have just one IRA and one account and your current employer. If they offer you a 403B, it is possible they also offer you a 457, which is another vehicle to save or invest. So also check with your benefits to see what, what other ways of saving they have available. That is really great. Um, here we have another question from Jose. He asks, what advice do you have for some um, for saving for the first home um, in a high cost of living area? That's a terrific question. Uh, think what that house, think about what you're buying when you're buying that house. And why do you buy, why do you wanna buy that house in the first place? And going back to the values, going back to the priorities and what's important for you. Think about, are you planning on staying on that location for the next 10 years, for example? Next 15 years. Generally, uh, people, I mean, now, especially now, people move a lot. So if you want to stay in that location for a number of years, then it, it makes sense to even buy a house. Uh, I would suggest, if, open a brokerage account, open a separate investing account and don't take a lot of risk because if you take a lot of risk, then all of a sudden you lose your down payment if the market crashes. So maybe you just set up an investment account, buy bonds or, or a simple account uh, where you just are saving. Your target for saving for a house is not to maximize return because when you're trying to maximize return, you're also maximizing your risk. And that could be problematic if you're, let's say, and I know someone that, that, that went through that. They, they saved for their wedding. She put her savings in an investment account. The market crashes 45% right before her wedding. 
So be careful. That's really good to um, take note of. Um, okay, moving on to our next question. Um, can you open a life insurance policy on someone else, such as your parents, without them knowing? Are there any rules around that? That's a great question. And generally, no, because life insurance generally requires to take medical exams, uh, aka blood tests, urine tests, and so on. So, uh, that, that generally that's not allowed. Uh, and then when, when you buy insurance policy, they, they, one of the first questions they're gonna ask is, okay, what's the insurable interest here? Why are you buying this policy for this person? What's, the, what's in it for you? Why are you trying to protect that if they die, you're gonna get it? So if they don't know they have a policy, well, that, that can be a little fishy. Really great points. Here we have a question from Carla. She says, um, any strategies or talking points to get family members who are hesitant to invest in higher complexity investments? Um, for example, moving their monies from CDs to RIAs. IRAs. IRAs, yeah. <sighs> That's a very good question. Uh, whoever made it, it's really understand their mindset. And uh, if, they, if they're not taking a lot of, if they're used to not take a lot of risk, I would think about well, why would you want them to take more risk? What is your concern? So express your concern to them, express the risks to them as well, because all of a sudden, if their CD that was very safe, if growing at 0.05% per year, AKA not growing, they move it to an index fund in an IRA and all of a sudden that IRA crashes, they're not gonna blame the market, they're gonna blame you. So try to understand why you want them to do that. Uh, yeah, there's a potential of more return, of course, but there's also the potential of loss. So maybe they don't want to take that risk. So that have that conversation with them. Um, So I'm just gonna say something before we move on to the next question. I'm like Vicente Fernandez, you know, Vicente Fernandez, he says, I'm gonna stay here as long people ask questions. So he says, I'm gonna stay here as long, as long people want me to sing. So I'm gonna be here as long as people want me to answer questions. So don't worry if Tecaria wants to stop the recording at the time, at the hour, that's fine. I can stay here, so I'm good. And I don't want to impose on Tecaria. So. And I'll just have, have like a minute before we close out and then if you want to stay after the um like 1 p.m mark feel free to stay stick around all right very good okay perfect uh let's keep going um here's a question from nathan he asks uh when it comes to getting rid of revolving debt versus investing and the rate of return is higher for investing than it is for your debt do you pay your debt over time and continue investing or do you use all that money to get rid of debt quickly considering inflation and buying power <laughs> that's a great question so <sighs> credit cards you're talking about revolving debt that means credit cards Credit cards will charge you a minimum of 10% in the US. They can go up to 25%. That is a 25% guaranteed rate of return, meaning there's no investment in the US or in the world that guarantees you 25% return. In other words, focus on paying that debt as fast as possible. However, that doesn't mean don't invest. If you have a 401k at your employer and they offer you a match, maybe invest up to the match 3%, 2%, whatever that is. And then focus all your efforts in paying, in paying off that debt. If your employer doesn't offer a, a 401k with a match, then determine a minimum amount that you wanna set aside for investing. Invest, maybe one, 2% of your salary, invest, and then focus all your ener energies on paying off that debt. And then once the debt is paid off, then you can focus on investing. 
Perfect. We have some other really good questions, mm -hmm. uh, but just I want to close out the video with this one question that I think we can all really benefit from, um, and then we'll we can continue with some of the other um, mm -hmm. more complex questions. This mm -hmm. is a question from Carla. She asks, "What type of questions do you recommend asking when you're looking for a financial advisor?" Okay, fantastic question. So if you go to NAPFA or XYPN, you don't have to worry about what they're going to sell you because their job is to sell you advice. If you go with an advisor outside of NAPA or XYPN, then the first question you need to ask them is, how do you make money? Please list me all the ways that you make money. Um, um, you'll be surprised. I've seen advisors making money in 10 different ways from 10 different, in, in 10 different ways. So be sure you understand how they make money. Then ask them if they're willing to sign you what it's, what it's called a fiduciary oath. A fiduciary oath essentially says that they're gonna act putting your interests first ahead of their own at all times. You'd be surprised how many firms refuse to do that because they don't wanna put your interest first. Again, if you're dealing with a member of NAPFA or XYPN, all of them, I guarantee you, they're gonna say, yes, here it is. Actually, this is what I signed with all my clients, no worries. But if you go with one of the big brokerage houses, that's probably gonna be, they're probably gonna tell you no, or they're gonna give you a reason to not to sign it. So just be careful about that, be mindful about that. I'm not saying they're bad, I'm just saying they're generally not willing to sign that document. And if you're okay with them not signing it, perfectly fine. Nothing wrong with it. Wow, I would have not known to ask that, but I just wrote that down. So yeah, um, I'm, I'm putting in the, in the chat as well. Fiduciary oath. Perfect. Fiduciary oath. I also and you can that. you can Google it and you'll find it. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. sorry. I also didn't know that um, some financial planners could all only cost about twenty five dollars a month because that's this that's a conversation that I've had with um, my partner as well. Like I think we should do that, and he's just like, uh no. So <laughs> important to know. Yeah. Um, I want to give it over to Sal. Do you want to close out now so that we can continue with the more complicated questions afterwards? Yeah, well, thank you, everybody, so much. I know we're close to the time. So if this was your lunch break, thank you for showing up and being here with us. Uh, we're hoping to do a lot more lunch and learns like this with other expert professionals, highlighting Latinx, just power here. Um, so thank you, Miguel, for being that today. And thank you again to Val and ECs for being our volunteers. Um, just a quick little memo, if you are looking for more events to join, please go to events.tequeria.org. We have a lot of events coming up this week. And I do want to highlight Selena's 50th Bitty Bitty birthday coming up on Thursday. So that's going to be an evening event of just trivia and fun um, and really cool prices. Uh, so check check that out on our website. And if you have any feedback or if you're looking to volunteer for more events, please reach out to me directly. I am on the Slack channel at Sal Ramirez, or you can also just email events at thecadia.org. And I'd be happy to connect and find you a spot to volunteer with. Thank you everybody for coming. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Val and Miguel for more Q&A. Well, real quick, uh, just sorry to interrupt everybody. I know if you have a chance, can you turn your video on? We want to do a group photo and we'll share it, post it, and we can express what we all have learned with our speaker, Miguel. So give everybody a couple minutes, fix your hair or your headphones. Now on the count of three, just give me a couple of seconds and I'll go through four pages. There we go. Okay, so keep smiling for about a minute and We'll start going on and we will take this. Got one. All right. Let's say cheese, taqueria, cheeseburger. There you go. See? All right. We'll do one more for those of us that are just deciding to click in and turn your camera on. Ready? Say, <laughs> I got us all. So we'll be sharing these. Thank you all. Beautiful. Okay, now we can keep going with the awesome Q&A. Um, let me know, are you going to turn off the uh, recording now? <laughs>
I think we can continue it if you want. And then if anybody has any like personal things that you want to share or things like that, please let me know so that I can edit it out of the recording. Um, perfect. Uh, Karina asked, when is the recording going to be shared? So I think that's more of a style question. We'll send out an email afterwards with the slides and also the link to the YouTube channel, uh, which is where we're going to drop in our recording. But give us about a week, depending on how much we have to edit, uh, just because we go minute by minute. Um, but we'll get it out within a week. Awesome. Thank you so much. So we have about um, three more questions. If you have any other questions, feel free to drop, drop them in the chat. Um, ECs has been slacking them to me. So I super appreciate that. Thank you so much, ECs. Um, here we have a question from uh, Carla. She asks, should you set up your emergency fund before investing? If so, how much should you have for your emergency fund? Yeah, emergency fund, definitely. The first thing, uh, and here I could go with what Dave Ramsey says, I don't agree with some of the things he say, but I would agree with this one, which is focus first on getting a thousand dollars on your emergency fund. Then once you do, then depending two, three, six months, and this is very important. The next part is very important of living expenses, not income, but expenses. So I know some people that have up to a year of living expenses in the emergency fund really depends on how much you're comfortable with having. Maybe one month is okay for you. Maybe you need two months, maybe you need three weeks. It depends on you, what's important for you and so on. Now, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't start investing if you still don't have your emergency fund. Maybe you do half and half, or maybe you do a portion, whatever portion you decide. But yeah, um, get an emergency fund, it's, it's, it can help you. Beautiful. Um, here we have a question from BD. She asks, is it worth it to keep a 20,000 mutual fund as an investment instead of paying it towards an outstanding mortgage? Ooh, that's a very good question. And I guess I would, excuse me, it would depend on the rate of your mortgage, the type of investments that your mutual fund is. Uh, let's say if it's an S&P 500 fund, it had a terrific return last year, the year before, and even the year before that. So if you if you had sold that out and pay up your mortgage, you would have missed out on those gains. So it depends on the on the in, on the on what is invested in your mutual fund. It depends on your rate on your mortgage, and also very important, it depends on how it makes you feel to have that mortgage. Some people hate debt. Some people are completely okay with having debt. So it's up to you again, going back to the values and priorities discussion that we said before. That's really good. I guess it depends on how comfortable you are with risk. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I like that. Here's a question from Erica. Uh, she asks, what advice do you have for preparing for your parents' retirement, especially when one lives in another country or are undocumented? Um, when you say hand over the keys, do you mean withdrawing from that set taxable investment account and handing over the money to them, almost like an allowance? Um, she says, because a lot of companies don't necessarily allow undocumented folks to sign up for checking, savings, investments accounts, mm -hmm. and that sounds tricky with taxes. Correct, correct. So yeah, I mean, uh, handing over the keys means giving the account to them uh, if they become legal residents, for example, if they are no longer undocumented. If they're gonna remain out of the country or remain undocumented, then my suggestion is to keep the money under your control and then give it to them as time goes. Now, there's a consideration that is, if you give them more than 15,000 per year, then that, that you need to report that as gift tax. There's a gift tax reporting that needs to be done once you do your tax return. Also, if they live in Mexico or Canada, it is possible if you provide more than half of their support, it is possible that you list them as, as your dependents. Again, I'm not an accountant, but that's something that to discuss with your accountant if, that's, if this is something that, that you do, if you support more, if you give them more than half of their support and they live in Mexico or Canada. So it's definitely something to discuss with your accountant. 
I really appreciate your background, Miguel, because um, I know that a lot of us are really scared to ask these questions about um, our family members who are undocumented. So I love mm -hmm. that we created this space um, that really feels safe to ask those questions. Um, I'm glad to hear. From Vidi, we have another question. She asks, if we are already contributing to our 401ks and have enough savings, should we keep our mutual fund going or would it be better to use those funds to bring down our mortgage and pay down sooner? So I think this is a little bit similar to one of Yeah, it's very similar to their question. Yeah, I mean, um, another thing that, that I didn't mention the last uh, question is if you sell those funds, you may incur in capital gains. So those capital gains taxes could be more than, the, than what you save in mortgage interest. So be sure you understand what you have in the account, what are the gains in those, in those funds. If you sell them, what happens if you sell them? If the, if the, if the gain is short-term or long-term or whatever, uh, then if you're comfortable selling that and paying that tax, then maybe it makes sense to sell it. If, if you're not comfortable, then maybe what you do is instead of saving more from your cash flow, you take you, that cash flow and increase your payment to your mortgage. Maybe it's a, it's a different strategy, or you get a bonus. Maybe you use that bonus to pay that mortgage. And it just depends on on on, on the tax impact as well of, of selling that position. That's really good to know. Here we have a question from Gustavo. Um, he asks if our company does not do a four hundred one k match, and we meet the income limitations for a Roth IRA. What are things to compare between? Um, I don't a trad IRA and our company's 401k. Did I say that correctly? Gustavo, let me know if I did in the chat. Yeah, there's a moment, there's a level of income where, where traditional IRA contributions are no longer deductible, particularly if they offer a 401k plan. So the thing about it is, well, you need to see how much are you willing to save? It doesn't matter if they don't give a match. The reality is that 401ks offer a much higher contribution limit. So you can put up to 19,500 in the 401k and it's all gonna be tax deferred. Well, whereas in the IRA, you can only put, put 6,000. Now, something that, something that you can also do is you can do what is called a backdoor Roth contribution and you can check it with your account and you can Google it. Essentially what it means, if you make too much money for a, for a deductible IRA, you put money in a traditional IRA or, or a, not a traditional IRA, you put money in an IRA, in a contributory IRA, and then immediately you move that money from your IRA to a Roth. Now it's money that you didn't deduct the money in your IRA, but you move it to a Roth and that is perfectly allowable. It's, it's Congress approved and so on. So it's, it's very doable. If you're not so sure about doing it, you can Google it or you can check with your accountant to see if a backdoor Roth makes sense to you. Yeah. I had no idea what a backdoor Roth IRA is, so I'm super glad that I came to this. <laughs> um, so from Adriana, she asks, are there any accounts specifically designed to help our aging family members save for healthcare costs? They don't currently have any accounts open, um, such as a HSAs. That's a very good question. Uh, generally, an HSA can only be done if you are employed and the company offers the ability to do that. It sounds like it would be better if you just open an account for them and put the money aside for them. Uh, specifically for healthcare, the HSA is generally the only option for that. But if the employer doesn't offer it or if they don't work, uh, maybe, the other solution is just to open a standard brokerage account or a standard savings account for them. Really good advice. I am going to hand it over to Sal because I do have to go to another meeting. It was so wonderful to be a part of this event. Thank you again, Miguel, and thank you again, Sal, for putting this together and to Tequeria and all you wonderful colleagues. Thank you, Val. <laughs> Thanks, Val. All right, so the next question is from Orlando. For UT, MA and UGMA accounts, do stock bonds for mutual fund options exist? And if so, what are your recommendations to proceed to create one for a child? Sure, so you can open, uh, the Otma Otma is really just the name of the vehicle. 
Uh, they are offered, every brokerage firm offers it. You can open one in Schwab, one in Fidelity, one in uh, Vanguard, TD Ameritrade, whatever. So it's, and they, they'll know exactly what you're talking about when you mention, when you bring this up. So it really depends on what you're trying to do with that money and what that money is gonna be used by your child. If it's a long-term investment, maybe some funds that invest in the stock market, or maybe a combination of funds that something that invests in the stock market, some bond funds. But uh, yeah, generally every, every investment option that is available on their standard brokerage account generally will be available under uh, an OTMA, OTMA account. So just remember that money belongs to your kid, it's not yours. The money, the moment that that money goes into the account, that money belongs to your kid, not to you anymore. Got it. Cool. So a little bit different to that question is from Carla, is there an account or investment type that provides long-term stability and potentially pays dividend that then we can use to our own discretion? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a normal investment account, a normal brokerage account. And it's, it's not the account itself, it's what you invest the money once it's in the account. So maybe you invest something low risk, maybe you invest something high risk. Uh, there's there's lit, literally tens and thousands of investment options out there available. So there's mutual funds, there's ETFs, there's a ton out there uh, available. So yes, I mean, there's definitely a way to do that. And maybe the standard brokerage account is a way to achieve what you're trying to achieve. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then from Juan, I feel like we all kind of struggle with this question is, between the three is like paying off school, school loans, um, saving for mortgage or saving money for investing. Where is actually a good place to start here? I hate my <laughs> answer, but it depends. <laughs> it always depends. It depends on the type of student loan that you have. It depends, uh, see why it's important for you to buy a house. Uh, what type of other investments you could do and so on. So okay, if you're able to make the minimum payment to the lo student loan okay, and do other things, just understand that the interest of the, int of the student loan will continue to grow. So maybe check the status of your loan, what's the rate on it, see if you can uh, refinance that loan and reduce the rate even further, yeah, and really, and, and take it from there. Yeah, and it seems like this one could be a perfect conversation with your financial planner to make sure that mm -hmm. your values and your goals are aligned as mm -hmm. to what comes in first. <laughs> exactly, um, exactly right. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm still in the boat, so definitely feel that. Mm -hmm. um, all right, and then it seems like we have one last question from Kimberly. Um, mm -hmm. You recommend investing money from your HSA account into the market. Um, they're interested in being able to build a medical savings account for her parents uh, for medical expenses when they're older. Yeah, so the, the money in the HSA generally is not available to use for other family members. In other words, if you want to use the tax benefit of the HSA, it has to be for you or your direct family, your, your spouse or your children. It, so the account in the HSA is really for you, not for your parents. Um, if you use it for something else, then there's taxes and penalties and other things. So I wouldn't use an HSA to save for somebody else. I would use an HSA to save for yourself and your family. If you want to save for someone else, then a standard investment account is a better way of doing it. Now, if, if you have recurrent medical expenses, if you're going to use that money in the HSA, if you say, for example, you have diabetes or some illness that requires continuous care, that means that you're gonna spend the money from the HSA probably every year. In that way, if that's the case, then it's probably not a good idea to invest it. Now, if you're very healthy, if your family is very healthy and you don't have a lot of medical expenses throughout the year, then maybe it makes sense to invest it. So if you're in the middle, then maybe you can invest a part of it and, and just leave it in cash, the other part of it. It really depends on, on how your health situation is your normal medical expenses and, and so on. I think I just learned something new. I didn't realize that, I always thought that like your HSA funds 
needed to be used within the year and only a certain amount could roll over to the next year. So we yeah, have to do some homework on that investing. Yeah, so there's the FSA, then the HSA. So be sure you understand what you have. Yeah. The FSA um, for sure, you cannot, you cannot take it over to another year. Uh, Thanks so much more homework to do. <laughs> <laughs> Great. On that note, Candy just asked, is there a good way to save for our own medical expenses during retirement? That's a very good question. So the HSA is a good option. It, you could also, as part of your retirement plan, so you're saving for your retirement, you're using your 401k, using other investment accounts and so on. So what you do, part of the process with a, with a financial planner is that they will help you estimate how much of, of medical expenses there will be. And what happens is as part of your investment plan, then allocate a portion of it to medical. It doesn't mean that it would need to be exclusively used for medical and the assumptions will probably be completely off the charts or completely different once you get there. But when you build your plan, a portion of those savings can be uh, both uh, directed or, think or, or thought for medical expenses. Well, thank you so much, Miguel. I think um, those welcome. were the last of our questions and thank you everyone who stayed, stuck around. Please do feel free to connect with Miguel directly. Um, you know, and like he mentioned, he's a certified financial planner. So please do reach out to him if you're interested in that or follow any, any of the other resources that were shared. Um, once again, thank you for your time and thank you everyone else for coming today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your questions. I'm so happy to answer them. To so, so happy to be here with you. Thank you, Sal, for having me. Uh, to the next event. <laughs> yeah, to the next event. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>